All right. Uh, so first of all, I want to say thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this. It is great to hear about uh, your naturalist club. There were some really interesting things that I would like to be a part of. Um, and Nancy, that is an ever important issue. And I'm very glad you are talking about it, especially since this talk um, is on conservation and on conservation of some of the less recognized species um, that hits right on target. Um, okay, everybody, so welcome. This is gonna be a bit of a different presentation. I'm combining things that aren't normally combined, but um, I hope it gives you a few new ideas. Uh, so the title of the presentation is Shedding Light on Those in Darkness, Creatures of the Night and Creatures of the Deep. Okay, so Bill already gave me a great introduction, um, but my name is Bridget Sparrow Sonoka. So I grew up here in Toronto um, and I've done field work in most places you can imagine. So I started off really focused on um, wetlands here in Ontario. I moved on to do different marine environments. Uh, as you can see on the picture on the left here, I was actually off the coast of British Columbia um, studying the intertidal out there. Um, I also spent some time in Colorado and studied different stream insects. Um, and I, as Bill mentioned, went on to do my master's in London, England, studying deep sea. Um, and I ended up back here. Um, my dream has always been to use what I've learned to protect Ontario species. Um, and I managed, I've always loved bats, but rarely get a chance to work with them. I managed to uh, work with bats here. Okay, so this is the outline for our talk today. Um, so first I wanna start off with what is conservation biology? I wanna go through a little public perception uh, activity. I want to talk about conserving unseen species. And then I'm gonna do two different case studies, um, both following a very similar path on the deep sea and Ontario bats. Um, and then I will conclude the presentation. Okay, so first um, to start, conservation biology has two central goals. Um, the first goal is to evaluate human impacts on biological diversity. So that means we wanna monitor how we are in fact affecting our environment, whether that's development, whether that's climate change, um, whether that's coming into contact with certain species, we want to try to encapsulate and monitor what that is. Second is to develop a practical approach to prevent the extinction of a species. So once we know how we are um, impacting biological diversity, we want to actually put into practice different mechanisms that can help us protect these species. Um, I think all different fields apply to conservation biology because um, there's conservation policy, policy, pardon me, and used from the fields of ecology, demography, taxonomy, and genetics. So conservation biology has kind of this overall aim, which is to provide answers to specific questions that can be applied to management decisions. So what can we learn about a species that is actually going to help us um, in terms of talking about how can we put this into practice? How do we actually protect these species? And next, the main goal is we want to establish workable methods for preserving species and their biological community. Um, so it's a lot more than just, we want to conserve species. It's about putting our scientific knowledge and our policy knowledge into practice. So to start off, um, one of the things we don't always think about when we think about conserving a species is what is the public perception of it? Where are we starting in terms of, do people really like the species? Are, are people interested in it? Have people never heard of it? Um, and so I wanted to do this little activity just to get uh, your brain thinking a little bit. And again, um, you can feel free to share in the chat, but also just think personally to yourself. I'm gonna show a few different pictures from different environments. And when looking at the picture or looking at the animal, I want you to just categorize what your initial thought is. Do you think that initial thought was positive, negative, or neutral? So we'll start off uh, with the dolphin, the bottlenose dolphin, and the great white shark. 
I'm sure you can see where I'm going here. Um, so these are marine environments. Next, we have the turkey vulture and the northern cardinal, both found here in Ontario. And then we have insects. So we have the monarch butterfly and a mosquito. These two appeared at the same time. So we have skunk and a little brown bat, a coyote, a black bear, a raccoon, and a massasauga rattlesnake. So we did go through those a bit quickly, but I hope it gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. So as a conservation biologist, when I start off, um, I've worked with a large variety of species, and I typically want to apply the concept I've learned to each species. But in order for me to do that, I have to take a stake in what the current public perception of that species is. So is it something that typically has a more positive, negative, or neutral reaction? Um, and that these perceptions may actually be based or formed by people's own personal experience. So it can be, for example, the Ontario species on the last slide, many of us may have come into contact with raccoons, coyotes, skunks, and those actual experiences may inform our, our perception of these species. Um, however, there can also be different things such as media, um, the very famous example of jaws and what that has done for sharks so that gave an overall kind of negative perception of sharks but the media has also done um, a lot more documentaries about it given a lot of attention to that issue um, and also some of these species which we commonly view as pests sometimes people can think of bat as pests i hope you don't feel that after this talk um, but also things like raccoons mice, bugs. Um, in society, there are sometimes things we deem we want to get rid of. And we want to really think about why that is and why we feel that way. Um, and the great thing about this is for species that we can come into contact with, we can change those opinions over time, whether it's through a presentation, whether it's through actually encountering the species. Um, we can learn a lot and have new opportunities to form new experiences. And so perception is always changing. So to, to focus in on what we'll be talking about today, um, conserving the unseen species. So there are many species that we might come into contact with. Um, for example, birds, there's lots of birding, there are things we can go out and see in the environment in real time and gain a, an appreciation for them that way. There's also lots of different documentaries on birds. Um, but for not all species is that the case. So there are two examples that I'm gonna talk about today is the deep sea. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that actually is and our Ontario bat. So there are some species that exist, exist in these environments that are not easily accessible. So bats are flying at night. They may be living in trees or living in your house, but you may not have a chance to see them and you likely will never have a chance to hold them or interact with them that way. Um, However, they might have been in your house at some time and you had that kind of interaction, um, but they're not something you can easily go out and see on a daily hike or a weekly hike. And same with the deep sea. So the deep sea is actually any area under 200 meters in the ocean, um, and we cannot go there uh, to those depths, but also for a long time, technology could not really go there. So unlike, for example, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, um, or other different types of coral reefs we've seen on TV, um, deep sea is very underrepresented and we don't have a chance, although I wish I could, <laughs> uh, to swim down there or to go in even a submersible down there um, and, and check out those species for ourselves and change that perception. Um, so that's important um, to note. And I also want to note with these two examples that I'm giving, the deep sea, um, a lot of people don't have necessarily a negative perception, but they don't know a lot about it. And for bats, unfortunately, a lot of people do actually have a negative perception. So this is something that I think about when approaching protecting a species is, is what are we dealing with? What is the current environment and what can we do to help or move that along? 
So to start off, I'm going to talk about the deep sea. So the work I'll be talking about is actually from a paper that I published based on my master's research um, with the Zoological Society of London, which is also the London Zoo in London, England, um, which have great resources, which I'd be happy to share after if you want to learn anything more about it. So just to give you a bit of an idea about the deep sea, it's just defined as any area deeper than 200 meters. Um, it can go up to 10,000 meters, much deeper than that. I have looked at video that is about 9,000 meters deep. I think that's the deepest I've looked at for now. Um, this deep sea area covers 65% of the Earth's surface. So it is one of the least explored habitats. Uh, a typical comment by many is that it's less explored than space, um, which is truly something to think about. Um, but it has covers such a large portion and is severely underestimated. These species provide lots of ecosystem services um, that we do not even kind of know or account for. So an ecosystem service is something that an animal or plant provides to us um, that can often be used by conservation biologists to attach a monetary value to say, look, these species are actually contributing all of this. And if these species disappear, we are losing all of these things that we don't even know we have and we are taking for granted. So some of those services are, um, there are huge carbon stores. So there's coral reefs down there, there's sponges, um, there's lots of different things that are thousands of years old that have been storing lots of carbon in their environment. If you remove these, damage them, break them, you're releasing carbon back into the ocean um, and back in to affect other species. They also cycle a lot of nutrients through the ecosystem. So these reefs are actually a lot of the places where um, deep sea fisheries are based. So halibut or prawn and shrimp, a lot of those are dependent on these deep sea habitats to function. Um, and then they also provide structural complexity. So very similar to a coral reef, the coral reef grows and then provides a home for fish, and octopus and sponges and skates and rays to live inside. Um, and this is very important for biological diversity. It's the same thing when you're looking into the deep ocean. Now to show you a few of the different pictures here, um, on the top right hand corner, we have the um, a sea pen, which is a really cool one. This one here, this white kind of folded one is actually a sponge. Um, and sponges and corals are animals. Um, we've got a coral reef starting here. We've got a few different types of corals on the bottom. So some of them form these hard structures and some um, are a lot more. This is actually called the cauliflower coral, which I'm sure you can see why. Um, we've got lots of different fish. We've got sea pens. We've got skates and rays. Basically, almost anything you could picture or imagine in a coral reef, there's almost a deep sea version of that. So what is threatening these deep sea environments? So they're increasingly being threatened by now by deep sea fishing activity. And this is what you can see in the picture on the left and the picture on the right. So what happens is you have basically a coral reef type environment. Now imagine if on the Great Barrier Reef, you drop down a very large, heavy metal plate and doors, dragged it along and scraped the bottom. You're not only catching the fish, you're scraping off everything that's living basically on um, the seabed. So you're destroying uh, large areas of coral reef. Um, and why this is a, is a huge problem is these deep sea species are very slow growing. Um, so they grow even slower than corals uh, in shallow water because there's less nutrients down there. Um, and these things can be thousands of years old. And so when you break them off, break them apart, it takes a long time for something like that to recover and have the same impact that it was having before, if it could ever recover. And another thing that's really important right now is deep sea mining activities. So this is a bit of a new one. Um, you may or may not have heard, but there's a ton of legislation going on in this right now. Um, Canada has not currently banned or stopped deep sea mining, um, but France, has just joined. There's a lot of European countries that are joining this. Um, so this is something to definitely keep in mind and um, look into. So one of the things about documenting these unseen species is we usually need some kind of technology. So this study site that I'm going to be talking about is in West Greenland on the continental slope. 
So it actually borders a lot of these habitats are the same areas that you'd see off the coast of Newfoundland um, and up around the Arctic waters in Canada. So just keep in mind that many of the species I'm talking about are found in Canadian waters as well. And this is a very kind of similar environment. So um, we drop these cameras down. What's really impressive about this is the PhD student I was working with rigged a regular old GoPro onto a camera. So one of the problems is the amount of money that it takes for these very fancy um, cameras. Uh, this is a lot, a lot cheaper. And if you lose it, which does happen when you're dropping things tens of thousands of meters down, um, it's a little obviously easier <laughs> uh, to replace. And but basically what this is, is a sled that will drop down to the bottom and it drags along or hovers along the bottom, depending on the type of camera, and it actually records video of the ocean floor. So then this is where I come in. I take a video like this or a still image, and this might look just like a bunch of random colors right now, but your eyes do get trained to it. It's like a game of I spy. So basically what happens is it gets loaded into a program. I have a list of species on the side. I click a dot, for example, this lovely fish right here. I would click the name of that fish, plop it right on, and that would count the species. Now I do this for thousands of images and hours of video. And in the end, you can get density counts um, and you can get distributions of all different types of species. We can also learn about which species are living together. Um, so for these cauliflower corals, um, they're typically found with lots of these different bryozoans that are living beside. So we can start looking into those dynamics and it's something that we couldn't necessarily go investigate, but now we can investigate in a much cheaper way and document that these species are here before they are threatened beyond repair. And so this is an example of some, some fun images from the paper um, that I did. So these are the cauliflower corals. These are the actinarians, so your sea anemones. Uh, these are actually called feather stars, which is pretty interesting. They're quite hard to see here, um, but once you get an eye out for them, um, they're quite interesting looking. You might have seen videos of them. They almost float like this along the water when they move. Um, we've got lots of different types of sponges. Um, mushroom soft corals, which are these little red ones here. Um, you can see the sea stars there and lots of other different types of bryozoans, which is not a sponge, but similar to a sponge. Um, so as you can see, when I look at all those different types of pictures, I'm analyzing how many are in each and how many are in a meter squared. So for example, for this one up here, um, the highest I found was 18 anemones per meter squared. So that's kind of how it works. We sample a bunch of different environments and then we can calculate the densities we expect in any given area, depending on the substrate type and depending on the depth level. So this is a little bit more about substrate. So then I can take each of those species and I can say, well, where do I find anemones? Do I find them on coarse rocky ground? Do I find them on coarse rocky ground with boulders? I know that sounds a bit similar, um, but there are differences and we're, working hard to kind of update how we actually categorize these habitats because we find new ones every time. Um, but basically what we can do with this information is we can look at these different um, types of species and we can kind of predict where they're going to be based on a substrate type. So this means we don't need to video every, every area of the ocean. We can try to figure out, okay, if we know this is one certain type of substrate type, um, based on the topography of the environment, based on other types of things, we can even do pick up grabs of substrate. Um, we can predict what species are going to be there. Uh, so this is a bit of an example on that. So this paper was actually focused on documenting these species that are considered very important for deep sea environments that provide these ecosystem services and trying to figure out what area could we recommend um, the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources to actually go about protecting. So this is creating a marine protected area. And as you can see here, um, bigger dots basically result in higher density. So this is just an example, looking at the same area, you can see, okay, we've got a lot of density here of these types of things. Um, and then in deeper areas, we actually find more different types of sponge habitats. So that's something to make note of. And then what do we actually do with this? So 
What I always want to talk about and what I will reflect on at the end of this presentation is we want to document these species, but then we actually want to put it into practice, put it into legislation, put it into a usable format for the public to use and for governments to use to make the changes and protect these habitats. So this is really interesting. Um, and again, I can link the paper for later if you're interested in reading it. This green area right here is the proposed ecosystem area that we recommended should be protected. Um, what's really nice about this is we actually, so we've actually looked at where the fishing effort is as well. The fishing effort is a lot lower in this area. So the darker red represents higher levels of fisheries. So where they're fishing for halibut and prawn. And because of this kind of sloped, you can see a bunch of the depth lines here. So it, you're having quite a changing topography. Um, it's not the best area for fishing. However, the ecosystem that's here is supporting the fish and prawn that are living here and here. So if you were to remove that and scrape it, and it only needs to be removed once, um, they can basically um, deplete all of the fisheries in these two environments. And, and Greenland was very actually interested in this. They did use it, which is super exciting to say a couple of years on from when we did this project. Um, because 90% of Greenland's exports is fisheries. So they are really interested in keeping, keeping that habitat safe and those environments healthy um, to support their whole kind of economy. Um, so it's about working within the regulations that are had, but also demonstrating and showing um, what we can do and what we've learned here actually allows us to predict the habitat for all these different types of areas because we can look at the depth zone, we can look at the substrate, and we can say what type of species we'll likely find there. Um, and we can make recommendations based on that. Um, and that basically allows for protections to be put in place um, before all the deep sea mining occurs, increased trawling. Um, there's some quite poor policies right now because we haven't been able to document a lot of this area. But we're hoping to change that, um, and this is one of the ways we're doing it. Okay, and we are switching gears now over to bats. Um, so this is really exciting, and the large part of the project that I'm going to describe with you here today is directly based on your own Hamilton Naturalist Club who participated in our community science project. Um, so I'm really excited to share this, and I can always answer more questions about bats later on. However, my colleague, Toby Thorne, who is the coordinator of our program, did do a bat talk that is already up in the webinar series. Um, so you can check that out as well. All right, so bats are mammals um, and belong to the order Chiroptera, which basically means is Greek for hand wing. Um, and that's actually because their wing has the same bones in it that we have in our hand and our forearm. They have elongated digits, and then they have their wing membrane stretched in between. Um, so a colleague of mine likes to say they fly by the power of jazz hands, um, which, is, <laughs> which is a good way to think about it. So these bats also, as you can see in this picture here on the right, um, give birth to live young and raise live young, which is a characteristic of mammals. They also um, tend to many different types of mammals, the majority of mammals, um, tend to nurse their young um, from mammary glands. So these bats um, would be holding on to their mother's nipples and nursing milk. Um, and that's how they're fed. So what's quite interesting about our bat species, this is one of our bat species. This is an Eastern red, similar to the picture Bill showed before, which is super exciting that you saw those. They're pretty rare. We don't get to see them often. Um, um, basically, the mother for each bat, <laughs> when it's born, basically weighs 30% of the mother's body weight. Um, so that's quite crazy if you think about that in terms of humans. If we were giving birth to a baby that weighed 30% of our bo body weight, you're giving birth to a 30 or 40 pound baby that you then have to strap on the side of your body and fly around with. So you can imagine that would be quite complex and bats do it amazingly well. So that is a super interesting feature of bats. Bats are also not uh, as closely related to rodents as some may think. They're actually most closely related to the group um, that has hippos, whales in it. 
um, which is quite interesting. We actually, as humans, are more closely related to rodents than bats are. Um, so keep that in mind next time you think um, they're a rodent. Uh, bats are also these kind of long-lived species. They can the record for a bat in North America right now is actually a little brown bat, um, which little brown bats are found here in Ontario, and it is 42 years old. So picture that as, as well. Um, okay, so currently there are over 1400 species of bats in the world. Um, you can find bats in so many different forests, in so many different areas. They eat um, fruits, insects, they're pollinators. Some of them are carnivores. There are some famous ones who uh, do actually lap up blood, the vampire bats. However, there are only actually three species of vampire bats and they are found in South America. So you do not have to worry about them here. Um, though, if you look into them, they are actually a very cute and very interesting species. And we have a lot of our medical um, knowledge has been dictated um, by them and their saliva. Um, so the first bat fossil was discovered around 52 million years ago. So they've been on the earth for a very long time and that's why they have diversified so well to their different environments. All right, so now I wanna talk about the eight bat species in Ontario. So all of our bat species in Ontario are insectivorous, meaning they're eating insects. They eat moths, beetles, mosquitoes, basically any different type of insect um, that you can find. Um, however, certain bat species do prefer different types of insects, and that also depends on the time of night that they're out flying and the season. Um, so you can imagine that as well. So we have the big brown bat here. This is currently our most common bat species. It hasn't always been, um, but right now, if you're seeing a bat, it is likely a big brown bat. Um, but big brown bats are also super interesting and super cute. Um, beside them, we have our tricolored bat. Um, and basically our tricolored bat has this amazing fur. So you can kind of see it here in this picture. This picture was taken by Melissa Donnelly, who is a member of our bat team. Um, and the exciting thing about this is you can see its forearm. Tricolored bats usually have this reddish forearm and their name actually comes from their fur. So each individual strand of fur has three colors in it that are basically brown, black, and a kind of orangey reddish color, um, different on different individual bats. But so that's why you can actually see here, you can see a bit uh, where the fur was parted, this kind of color variation. These are one of the rarest species in Ontario, they can be um, quite hard to find and they are very, very tiny. Um, they are also federally endangered and provincially endangered. Um, so you can keep that in mind moving forward um, when we talk about our community science results. Now I want to introduce you to the three different myotis species. Um, so we have the Northern myotis, which is also federally and provincially endangered. Um, this is also sometimes known as the northern long-eared bat, because as you can see from this picture, their ears are extremely long, and that's their defining feature. Um, these northern bats we are extremely worried about right now, and that is because they are typically um, known to be forest-only dwellers. So when some of our other bats can adapt to being in houses, um, right now we found that northern myotis and, and right now the literature states that they need a certain area of forest um, to be able to keep a population. That's why we're quite worried about that species. It's typically what our, my coordinator would say the species we're most worried about. The really interesting thing about that is by some twist of fate, um, Rouge National Urban Park right beside the Toronto Zoo, if you've ever visited, has a population of northern myotis that we've been studying for a few years. Um, and there's some papers on that as well, which is really exciting because we're able to learn about them. And this is a species that truly cannot be found right now um, very easily in Ontario. Right beside that, we have the Eastern small-footed myotis. Um, and the Eastern small-footed myotis has this very distinctive kind of black mask. And they have, as their name suggests, very tiny feet. Um, they are only seven millimeters, 
Um, so that's hard to picture because all of these bats could basically fit in the palm of my hand. These ones are even smaller, um, but uh, they have very tiny feet. They are also, what's quite interesting is they are crevice dwellers. So these types of bats, so many of our different bats can be found roosting in trees during the summer, in, in loose bark, in buildings. Um, Eastern small-footed myotis have actually been found a lot kind of around different the Niagara escarpment, and they tend to actually lie and roost horizontally tucked into crevices. Um, so that's quite interesting. They are provincially endangered, currently not federally endangered, but they are endangered in Ontario. And then the little brown bat. It's another one we are quite worried about, and I'll talk about the threats shortly. Um, it is both federally and provincially endangered. Um, the little brown bat used to be the most common bat in Ontario until about 10 years ago, and I'll talk about that very shortly. Um, so they used to be more common um, than the big brown bat, but they have had a massive decline, um, and so we are quite concerned about them. All right, and next we have the migratory species of bats. So all of these different species do have some kind of form of migration, but the past five species I talked about are what we call our resident species. So the ones that we have are staying in Ontario year round. So they basically will start off um, in a typical year um, overwintering in a cave somewhere in Ontario or in a different roof somewhere in Ontario. They will wake up and have their babies in the summer. They will mate in the fall and then they will go back to the roost. Now these migratory species fly up from the south to spend their spring and summers here raising their young um, and then they actually fly down south to warmer temperatures so they are not just going back into caves and hibernating they are actually flying they can fly to they've been known to fly to florida to mexico basically anywhere that's southern and warmer with a higher population of food so insects all year round that they can eat um, so these are our long distance migrators. We start off with the hoary bat. This is the largest bat species that we have. Hoary, the name actually comes um, from these white frosted tips that you can see on this bat. Now I say this is the largest bat, but it is still only about 32 grams. It's still only the size of basically an eyeliner pencil or a lipstick. Um, and uh, they are, long distance migrators. So they fly high and fly far. Um, they also are typically flying in a more open canopy or above the canopy. Um, then we have the Eastern red bat. So this Eastern red bat, keep your eye out. They are on their way right now if they have not already gone past, but during the fall, um, they actually have been known to roost in leaf litter on their migratory way down. So before you are getting rid of your leaves, if you are doing that this year, um, make sure you give them a little shake and hopefully you're not disturbing one of these guys and, and why they do that is they actually dig into those to keep warm overnight before they not overnight during the day to continue their migration um, later on and of course they have this characteristic beautiful red color um, red orangey fiery color they've also got quite the personality um, I've been lucky to see one of these and um, finally, we have our silver hair bat, which is another long distance migrator. Um, these we don't catch as much. So these three species we don't often catch when we're trapping bats and releasing them in our nets, in our nets. And that's because of kind of how they move about the environment um, and when they're active, which is sometimes later at night. And this silver haired bat, you can't see it here, but this is a bat that was caught up north this year um, by one of our team members. It's got this very, very black fur. So although a lot of bats kind of seem black from far away, a lot of them are actually brown. This is black all over with silver frosted hair down the back. Okay, so why are these important? Um, recently, so November 1st, 2022, um, one of my colleagues, Melissa Donnelly shared this with me. Um, and so typically we had a lot of information about bats importance around the world. They're, they're pollinators, they're crucial for different types of habitats, but because of the threats that they've been facing here, we haven't truly been able to study them more in-depthly because we've been having a hard time finding um, large enough populations to answer these more developed questions. However, it's a super um, 
exciting to announce, and this is actually a very interesting study um, that they did out of the University of Illinois that actually showed that these bat species with the pest control levels that they're doing, so with the bugs that they're eating, are actually protecting young trees from damage. So basically what they did is they set up um, these kind of bat exclusion areas in the forest and, and basically they would open it up during the day, let birds come in, let all other species come in, and then they would close the mesh at night. This mesh allowed insects to move in, but it did not allow bats to pass through. Um, and basically what they did is they compared um, the young trees and the insect damage in the, the, uh, the plots that had access, that bats had access to and the ones that didn't. Um, and they range on different types of species um, from three to nine times more damage the insects had on, on trees. Uh, and, and this is young saplings, so trees that are growing up, which will be the next populations for our forest continuing into the future. When bats weren't there, they were decimated, they were, their leaves were removed, they weren't spreading, they weren't growing enough to survive the winter. Um, and this is, this, is, this is crucial, and this is one of the first times it's kind of been shown in North America in a forest um, setting. So it's a really interesting paper. Um, it was very exciting for our team. And so this is quite important. And then for also there's pest control for agricultural uses. So they do eat a lot of bugs. Um, we put a lot of money into, into spraying our crops and protecting our crops from pests. And if we didn't have bats, that would be, we would have far more <laughs> um, of these kind of pest species that are in our crops. So they're actually saving a lot of money. And if you remove bats, um, you would have to invest a lot more in trying to protect the crops to get any kind of food yield. Now, I briefly mentioned our threats before. Um, there's lots more information about these. I'm going to touch on them briefly as I want to get into the community science um, portion. Um, but two of our main threats in Ontario, the first is white nose syndrome, which you might have heard of. So this is white nose fungus. As you can see on the bats here, I want you to focus on what's actually on the nose, the little puffs, uh, fragments of white. Um, the rest of their fur that looks like it has are just little droplets, water droplets on it. So it's, it's concentrated on the nose. And basically this is a fungus that normally during the year, any other time, bats could just groom right off. But what happens is when they hibernate and they're not grooming, the fungus grows on their nose. And what happens is it causes them to wake up. It causes them to wake up several times um, during their hibernation period. And especially at the beginning, um, many of the bats then did not make it through the winter. This happened around 10 years ago. It was a result of, um, and they have tracked this now, a human, uh, or <laughs> one of us, uh, having have been, was hiking in Europe, got this fungus on his shoe. This fungus is not native to Ontario or to North America. What they actually did is they hadn't um, cleaned their boots. They walked into a cave in New York um, and very quickly this fungus infected bats and spread because bats are flyers and they're migrators. So it spread all across North America, um, predominantly right now on the Eastern seaboard. This only happened 10 to 15 years ago um, and it was documented to be 94% of hibernating bats. So if you walk into a cave um, and you have thousands of bats, hundreds of bats, 94% of those bats were wiped out. And that was shown in Ontario, Quebec, um, and Nova Scotia, I believe. It is considered by some ecologists around the world to be the fastest and most drastic decline of mammals ever documented. And it happened in our own backyard. Um, and it is currently spreading to British Columbia right now as well. Now our populations have had this little bit of a bounce back because there are species that survived this um, and therefore are kind of passing on this resistance to it, but it is still a large problem and it's, and it's why we lost so many of our bat species in Ontario. Um, the second is wind power. So unfortunately white nose syndrome does affect the 
hibernating bat species in Ontario, but wind power actually has a dramatic effect on the migratory species. Um, so it's kind of unfortunate that we have these two threats. Um, wind power is much more manageable and controllable though. And this is basically because the bats fly in uh, near the blade. So it's not actually what's believed right now is there's lots of research being done into this. It's not actually that the bats hit the blade, um, but the bats fly into the blade and the pressure gradient that's created by this big spinning blade um, almost crushes the bats and they fall. Um, so this, however, the good thing about this is in very high flying in very windy times, bats don't fly. Um, and obviously wind power works best in higher wind. So if we can find where that gradient is and, and mitigate that, we can have the benefits of wind power and a far reduce the mortality um, that these migratory bats are experiencing. Okay, so on to community science. Now, what is community science? It is defined as the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. So how does this work for our project this year? Um, we partnered with several different groups, one of them being the Hamilton Naturalist Club and loaned out an acoustic monitor. So you can see it right here. And basically this is a microphone. This records bat calls. Bats make echolocation calls to see their environment. So they basically fly through the forest screaming at night um, and how they actually see their environments around them, although they have pretty good eyesight, um, which is typically not believed for bats, how they see their environment around them is they send off, they send their voice out into the environment and it echoes back and then they get this kind of mental picture of what's around them. Um, so luckily they've given us a trick to record them and we can look at these echolocation calls and try to identify the species. So when you get an echolocation call, this is an example of an eastern red bat. Now what's interesting is we're not listening to the calls um, because most bat calls are um, from 20 um, up to 200 kilohertz. Um, our human hearing tops out at 20 kilohertz. So what we actually do, although it might seem a little bit backwards, is we visually look at the call and basically based on the frequency, the shape of the call that the bat's making, we can identify um, the species of bat. Now this is easier. Some species have really distinct calls and we know them right away. And some species are a lot closer together. And so we can only estimate up to a certain level of what species it is. Um, so this is an example of a bat call of an Eastern red bat. And just to show you, um, I'm, I'm so excited this year, our community science project, we had five different groups. Um, the green dots, I apologize for the green and red. I didn't realize I was going for Christmas theme, but I guess it's, it's almost that time of year. Um, so Hamilton, as you can see down there, um, the green dots are where your group collected, but you can look at the spread of all the other red dots across to see the project you've been a part of this year. So. We, we loaned out these acoustic monitors and we documented bats all across this area of Ontario, which we have a team of four. We could not do this on our own. And this is giving us incredible information. Um, and so I wanna say thank you so much. You are contributing to something um, amazing and this kind of larger picture. We could only, we believed in it, but we could only dream it would work out this well. Um, so I really want to say thank you. And this is just, you've done such an incredible job this year and it means so much um, to us. And now we can investigate and compare all these different types of monitoring events from across Ontario to learn more about these bat species. And finishing up here. Um, so the similarities between these different species, um, seems, they seem quite different, um, but they have, historically not been studied very well due to a lack of funding. There's been poor documentation before because they've been harder to look at. There is a lack of just general scientific knowledge. Now for bats, there's knowledge about lots of bats around the world, um, but there is kind of a, a lack of knowledge in Ontario for the ecology of bats since the massive drop-off that we had. Um, public perception, these species are highly threatened and they also involve complicated field work. And just to kind of conclude here, we used 
or I used what I realized when I think about this and, and, and my career as a biologist is I used quite similar methods to document both species. So you locate the unseen species, you use some kind of technology that allows you to document their distribution. This allows you to fill in knowledge gaps, as with the bats, you guys are filling in knowledge gaps across Ontario and combined together, we can learn a lot about that. You share information with the public. So we do these talks, we're, we're so excited to have this opportunity. And, and we also know for all of you that have um, contributed to the BAT program, you have also been talking to everybody else too, which, which is a huge thing um, to help bats in Ontario. And then we also want to put this into practice. We want to use the information we gain to petition the government to change laws and increase protection. And now this will come after. So we are still in the beginning stages of our community science project. We are working on publications to come out that will verify this data um, because we can say that the bat calls there, but we can't say it's living there um, for a various number of reasons until we can kind of confirm and catch it. We can use this to direct all of our future work and we can learn a lot more acoustically than we previously thought. And so how can you help? Many of you have already helped. You're part of a program that is very interested in conserving Ontario species, which is amazing for us to see. Um, so it's about educating yourself and others, it's about participating in these voluntary programs, the bird watches, the bat watches, the turtle watches, the frog watches. Um, it's about advocating for these species at risk and working to preserve these habitats, which could not be more on the nose for what you guys were talking about in the beginning of this meeting. And I wanted to say thank you. So I will stop sharing now. Um, it was a little bit long, but we can get to some questions. Well, thank you very much, Bridget. That was very informative, very entertaining. And it's interesting how you bridge two totally different topics. Uh, they really couldn't be much more different, but the, it did flow very well showing how, um, you know, looking at things that are very difficult for humans to, to sample. Um, I mean, I was quite amazed by your slides showing uh, all the life in, in the deep sea habitats and, and, you know, the percentage of the earth that's covered in that kind of habitat and how important that habitat is, even though almost all of us know nothing about it. And of course the bats, I mean, I love bats. And um, I mean, I'm mortified by what's happened to bats. And uh, uh, you've provided some hope that uh, some of these species that have declined catastrophically might, uh, might be able to survive. And maybe in another 50, 60 years, they might be back at the population levels they once, they once had. Um, uh, global warming uh, notwithstanding <laughs> so yeah thanks for that that was very informative so, that is great and oh, thank you so much i see three questions here um, yeah I, I can be the moderator for the questions so um, okay perfect okay so um if you have bats in the attic how can you safely remove them so the number one thing you always want to remember um, when you do encounter bats are um, you never want to handle them. Um, this is important for many wild bat species or many wild species in Ontario in general. Um, one of the things uh, you can do, there are many different ways you can think about it. So um, bats are very loyal to their roost. So if they are roosting in your attic, um, you might want to think about the time of year that you are trying to, to evict them. So this can be, maybe you avoid the time of year that they're having their babies in July um, and in August, and you're thinking more in the fall, you wait till the bats have left and you can actually close up that area. Um, and, and, and you can put bat boxes, if you're interested in that, on your property to kind of mitigate this, give them somewhere else to go. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot about kind of giving them the opportunity. So if they are not causing you kind of imminent danger. Obviously, if if they are, usually they are, are pretty harmless unless they are um, into contact. They're much more scared of humans. They are not interested in coming near you um, or coming around you. Um, 
however, of course, you can also have someone come um, and and kind of safely remove them if they were actually inside your house. If they're up in your attic, you you might want to watch them at dusk, find out where they're actually coming out. And then I would recommend if you can wait um, for a time of year where you think they are evacuating, where they're not having their young, um, to give them a bit better of a chance. Um, so that's what I would say for that. But the number one thing is do not handle the wildlife yourself. If you do happen to have it actually inside your house or kitchen, the best thing you can do is turn all your lights off, open a window, open a door. It likely will fly out on its own. And if not, you can call a wildlife rehabilitator um, who can move it for you. Um, but no, do not uh, pick it up or touch it just with your bare hands for the protection of the bat and yourself. Okay. I, I would say too, um... If you have bats in your attic, you should be happy that you have bats in your attic, as long as they stay in your attic. And it's um, an old style attic, which I would say that's, I'd be more than happy to have bats in my attic. And uh, I kind of wonder if they can be safely removed and if some, um, if the, you know, some might actually get um, sealed up in the attic and then unfortunately die. So I don't know, considering the, the problem that's happened with bats, we might want to try and exist with them living in our attic. Another question, um, where can one learn uh, more about bat migration um, in terms of what species go where and what time of the year? Um, so we have lots of different documents on, and I will pass along after this or an email that can be distributed um, on our website, batfortorontozoo.ca, which actually describes each of the species in more detail. We also have blogs about them if you're looking for a specific species. Um, but you typically, they, are, they show up around late April, May, basically when you're getting that first spout of warm weather. If you have warmer weather earlier in Ontario, bats will start appearing um, and that's what we're finding. And so their season is getting longer, but they do do swarming kind of in September, October, November um, when they're initially swarming, which is their mating process, and then they will be flying off and migrating. So you can actually find those different things. The actual locations um, and caves, their hibernacula are protected in Ontario. So we actually don't even know where they are unless we are studying a particular um, cave. So if you're looking for that type of information, they are protected, especially with what happens with white nose syndrome. Um, keep in mind and anytime you're visiting an area or if you're trying to see bats, um, you know, think about those things. Think about the fact that you might want to be cleaning your cleaning your boots when you're moving. And that also, as someone who worked in um, aquatic environments for a long time, that's how algae spreads in streams. So algae, fungus, all these different types of things um, can really be mitigated by if you're hiking in one conservation area and you go to hike in another conservation area, try to clean off the bottom of your boots. Um, so that went a bit away from migration because I forgot to say that, um, but there's lots of different information on our website about that um, that can help you out for whatever species you're interested in. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, when can we sign up for bat monitoring 2023? Yeah, so I am excited to say that our project is continuing into next year. Um, so you can always send us emails to bats at torontozoo.ca to express your interest. Um, we do have a Hamilton uh, Naturalist Club group um, already started. If, um, if, of course, that is up for all of you, if you guys would like to continue in that program um, and what volunteers would like to continue and what new volunteers would like to join. Um, so it's usually about an expression of interest. The earlier we can get interest expressed and get an idea of numbers, um, we do have a limited number of acoustic equipment, but we can kind of manipulate and move those around depending on the numbers that we're having. So if you can even as a group or individually kind of document your interest, how many people would actually be interested after hearing our presentation and let us know those kinds of numbers. We can do our best to try to accommodate for that and give more people the chance um, to collect more data. Okay. And uh, somebody has a question, which uh, we often get about bats and rabies. I've met a lot of people who seem to think bats have a high um, probability of having rabies. Is that a myth? It is a myth. So bats actually have one of the lowest incidences of rabies of all of the species. So it is possible and it is a it is a very serious thing to consider. Um, but in Ontario, 
lots of other species, um, skunks, for example, have a higher incidence of rabies. There's a very low incidence of rabies for bats in Ontario. Um, it is very serious. That doesn't mean that's why we don't recommend handling. We are always rabies vaccinated and vaccinated for other things. Um, but the incidence is a lot lower um, than you believe it to be. Um, it's the number is escaping me right now, but it's 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 a very, very low percentage, somewhere under 10%, much lower than that. Um, so it's 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 very rare that that happens. Of course, that changes depending on the year, and, and the government is always monitoring that. Um, so you can you can you can see that, but bats are not interested in you. They will not fly around you. If you see bats flying around you, they're likely trying to eat the bugs that are attracted to you. <laughs> um, so their bats have kind of incredible echolocation. Some species can kick can pick spiders off a web without actually disturbing the web. Um, so they are not flying, or catching in your hair. Um, don't touch them and they will not um, bother you. But also the, the idea that you get bit by a bat and get rabies is, is, is very outdated for the situation right now and, and what we know about bats. Um, and, and I've been working with them and I can tell you, <laughs> I've worked with a lot of different species, but I, I can guarantee that that is, is very low. It's important, um, but incredibly low risk. Can, can bats survive a rabies infection? So bats actually do have a better ability to kind of have different um, host, different types of infections. Um, and that's actually being looked into to medically speaking. Um, so it's possible, but the thing is with rabies, rabies is a very specific disease and you typically do not recover from rabies. Um, so it is, it is something that kind of actually affects your, your mind um, or, and your behavior. And so we do have, of course, now we have vaccinations and things that can stop that. So if, if you ever come into contact or you think you might be bit, if you come into contact with any type of species, we always recommend going to your doctor and asking because you, you get a shot, you're fine. Um, doesn't matter if it actually did or actually didn't. Um, but species that don't have that ability kind of do not survive that. So they're right. not continuously passing that on forever and it's it's growing immeasurably um i do not know okay. the very very detailed specifics of that but no okay and another question here are you able to share anything about that um sonar detection um is is, is sonar the correct word for that uh, so anyway the we, question was are you able to share anything about bat sonar detectors it would be uh, great to get some for the Hamilton Naturalist Club volunteers out there in the region. Yes, so this is actually something we're looking into and and um, this is kind of very exciting because we've had a lot of our different groups that are interested in kind of getting their own monitors. The monitors we're using, the Anabats, are expensive because they are very kind of specified equipment and easy to use, so they're in the range of $1,200. But as you can see, what you did with one bat monitor in one season, there is a very high output for that. Um, however, you can also get um, handheld monitors um, that basically allow you to hear bats, which is kind of exciting. So you can go walking out at night um, and there are different versions, some that are a lot cheaper where you can just listen and it translates the, the echolocation sound into a sound that you can hear um, and you can, adjust it to a certain frequency to identify different bat species. Um, there are also monitors that you can actually connect to if you have an Android phone that plug into your phone and, and play the output um, out into your phone. So there are lots of different options for that. It depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for kind of an investment for doing kind of this true bat monitoring, um, you might need one more expensive that's uh, durable and will hold up in the weather. Um, but you can do lots of different ones that are a lot cheaper um, that you can monitor. And what we wanna do eventually is kind of create this platform, this, this process for studying bats that can be used by anyone who wants to buy a monitor. So right now there is a limit. It takes um, kind of a lot of skill to learn how to identify um, bat species and bat calls in Ontario because they're very um, particular. Um, but we are really excited about anyone who's actually interested in going out 
um, as a club in documenting these species. We have conservation authorities who, who have participated in this project who are now interested in doing that as well. Um, and so we hope to eventually have a template that can be used by anyone who wants to document these species. Um, and a comment from um, more of a comment from Melissa Donnelly. Uh, the migratory bats are also tracked with MODIS, uh, which MODIS is usually done with birds. Little transmitters attached to the birds, and then when they fly by or happen to fly close to towers, uh, the signal from the transmitter on their leg is picked up, and the uh, towers are all across North America so that um, birds can be tracked individual birds migration can be tracked and of course that can be done with other thing and, and uh, bats uh, are included in that. Um, do you have uh, any experience with um, uh, the MODIS system in bats? So that's actually what our program has been developing. Um, so it's a very new way of looking at it. Um, so for bats there are not currently tags. So the tag has to be less than 5% of an animal's body weight, and we do it even less than that, and that is so it does not have a, a major effect on the animal. So what we do is actually with our bats, and we do do it with species at risk in Rouge National Park and around the um, kind of closer to the Georgian Bay area, um, we do catch bat to basically put a little tracker in between their shoulder blades on the back, um, and you let them fly off. This tracker um, is basically attached with kind of skin glue that is used for humans. So they do groom it off in kind of five days to max of two weeks, but they usually groom it off before then. Um, and what this actually does, we used to, and still do for this in-between time, run around with a large metal pole in the middle of the night in the forest and chase the bats to get this transmitter. What this MODIS tower allows us to do, um, so for any of you who aren't familiar, the, there are these kind of big kind of satellite-ish looking towers um, that are typically used for, for tracking birds movements. And what happens is when any species flies near this tower, the tower records the ping that it's getting, the signal that it's getting off that tag and can note that down, which obviously is a lot better for flying species because they move far, they move fast, much farther than I can move in a forest at night. Um, and we can kind of get this whole idea of what they are doing. Why we want to monitor at night is because we want to know where they're foraging. We want to know, um, is this bat staying in this forest? Is it going to the surrounding neighborhoods? And that's actually what we have a master's student working on who is part of our lab and part of a lab at Carleton University. That is what she's looking at right now. Um, and it was our coordinator, Toby, who basically uh, rejigged some modus towers to fit uh, mini modus and make them for bats. Um, so that's really, really new and really super interesting. Um, but we are doing that and that will give us a lot more. So I said, our first goal is to document and find them. Now, once we find them, we're looking into what their actual ecology is so we can know what we need to do to help them. Okay, I, I just had one question. Um... There's a species of bat in Ontario, and uh, I know it can be found um, um, roosting under um, rocks on talus slopes. Mm -hmm. Is that the long-eared bat or the small-footed? It's likely the eastern small-footed um, myotis. So they are those kind of crevice dwellers. Um, the Some of the other bat species can, if there's certain cavities, they could roost in them and there's potential for it to be other species. However, what's documented in Ontario right now is that the Eastern small-footed myotis, so a lot of people who do outdoor rock climbing actually encounter Eastern small-footed myotis roosting during the day, tucked into all these different kind of crevices in, in, in mm. rock piles, rock slopes, even sometimes during the fall if you have, or, or during the summer, if you have large wood piles, those mm. create crevices, bats could be roosting in there. Um, so if you're having a campfire, <laughs> Check your logs first, please. Um, certain things that we, you know, people didn't imagine that bats were living in all these different types of places. Yeah, okay. Uh, are there any more questions before we sign off for the night? Okay, I guess there's no more questions. 
So thanks again, Bridget, for that uh, excellent talk tonight. Thank you. Uh, we learned quite a bit. I noticed uh, Peter just sent a uh, little congratulations. Thanks, Bridget. Great presentations. So yeah, thanks again.